And I think this is a good thing that you can listen to if you're looking to prepare for your commercial check ride. So you're listening to the VSL Aviation Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Lake, and this is episode 15. Thanks for listening. Today's episode, we're going to be covering the commercial airman certification standards, and this is actually going to be the first part of at least a four-part series over the commercial uh, airman certification standards. Uh, so if you've listened to any of my other podcasts, you know that, uh, or, or watched the YouTube videos, these are available on YouTube as well. Uh, but what it's meant to be is uh, helping prepare you for the check ride. So I'm a flight examiner or a designated pilot examiner located in central Arkansas. And so I've done tons of these types of check rides. And one of the things that I see applicants uh, struggle with is knowledge of the airman certification standards. And it's just a little bit of an unknown thing, right? Going into a check ride, uh, you're sitting down with a DPE who obviously gives check rides all the day, all the time. And then you're sitting there and, you know, if this is your initial commercial, it's probably just the third check ride you've ever taken. So there's a little bit of an imbalance there, right? The the designated pilot examiner is super comfortable with the situation and you're like very uncomfortable with the situation because this is only your third check ride. You probably don't know what to expect. Uh, maybe you have a little bit of, uh, a, well, I say you don't know what to expect. You know a little bit of what to expect because you've taken a couple before. Uh, but anyway... This podcast is meant to just help you understand how an examiner is going to present the the check ride to you, and uh, help ho- hopefully cage your study to where you're you're studying the right stuff on the on the days and weeks leading up to your check ride. So we're gonna first talk some things uh, generally about the commercial pilot certificate itself. Most pilots get the commercial pilot certificate after they've already completed their private pilot and their instrument. So the typical flow is you get your private pilot single engine land uh, rating, then you go to your uh, instrument airplane check ride, and then you do your commercial single pilot or commercial airplane single engine land check ride first, or the that's the third check ride, sorry, that you take. Um, now, if you look in FAR 61, it defines several different um, types of commercial check rides available. Uh, the most common three are probably the airplane single engine land, the airplane multi engine land, and the rotorcraft or the helicopter uh, commercial check rides. Those are all three different kinds you can take. So typically, you're you're going to qualify for the single engine land first. Um, now, if you're watching this for your commercial multi pilot or multi engine check ride. Uh, Stay tuned because I will be releasing a podcast that that covers the commercial uh, multi add-on, uh, but that's just an add-on check ride. So today, or on this series, we're we're specifically talking about the airplane single engine land commercial rating. Um, so the Airman Certification Standards right now, and we're in uh, uh, April of 2022. The current one was released in June of 2018. Uh, so that's the most current Airman Certification Standards. So you want to make sure you're using the most current. Um, I've got a kind of a customized one here that I'm looking at, and it's broken down uh, into 12 different areas of operations. Uh, And today's podcast, we're going to focus on area of operation one, which is pre-flight preparation. If you've watched my other shows uh, or listened to my other shows, you know that uh, pre-flight preparation, area of operation uh, Roman numeral one or one, uh, that is where the oral uh, part of the check ride comes from. So uh, we've got area of operation one and we have tasks. Well, if we go to the table of contents here, you can see what we have tasks A, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I. Um, so those are all the tasks that we have that we're going to cover today. Uh, we're not actually going to talk about the water and seaplane characteristics because we're, we're focusing in on the single engine land. So we're going to start the oral. Um, and, and you will start the oral when you do your check ride with uh, area of operation one, task A, which is pilot qualifications. So if this is the first ACS show you've listened to, um, let me first begin um, real quickly breaking down what the ACS, uh, what this task looks like. And it's broken down uh, into task, reference, objective, knowledge, risk management, and skills. But really the three main parts of the the task are knowledge, risk management, and skills. Those are your main three things that you're tested on. Uh, the ACS requires that us, a DPE, uh, 
sample your knowledge of at least one knowledge item, at least one risk management item, and then all of the skills. So that's what you're going to be uh, asked about is at least one knowledge, at least one risk management, and all of the skills. Uh, now the caveat to that is if, if the test is, uh, if there's a required written exam to go with this, which for the commercial there is, so there's a commercial written exam that you will have taken before you sit down and do your check ride, uh, or your practical test. So as a, as a DPE, I have to take your written exam results and I develop a plan of action kind of customized for you, uh, individually that takes into account all the questions that you missed on the written. So let's say you you missed a couple questions on uh, pilot qualifications. So there would be a code on your written exam, uh, and you can see that code on the left-hand column of the ACS, uh, Area of Operation 1, Task A. Uh, the first knowledge item code is CA.1.A.K1. So that means you missed a question in regards to certification requirements, recent flight experience, and record keeping. So I would have to ask that question. Now I could use that um, in addition to other knowledge items that I ask, or I could use that as the only one. But remember, the minimum is one. I might ask more than one question and uh, sample your knowledge there. So down on the risk management, we've got two risk management items. And then the skills. That's what I tend to focus on in the podcasts because the skills are I think they're the most important thing. If you can demonstrate proficiency in all of the skills of the ACS, you will pass your check ride. So focus on the skills. Read through all of the skills on the check ride you're about to to take. And if you can demonstrate proficiency in every single one of those skills, you will pass the check ride. Like, that's, that's it. That's the test. So our first skill for pilot qualifications is apply requirements to act as PIC under visual flight rules in a scenario given by the evaluator. So since this is a commercial check ride, uh, I'm going to ask, uh, or your examiner will ask some questions in regards to exercising PIC privileges on a flight that you need a commercial rating for. So a flight that you're being paid to do, which opens up this whole bag of worms as far as, uh, you know, part 135 in charter and illegal charter, uh, cost sharing, all of that is going to get talked about here, or a lot of it is. So uh, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, imagine the, the plane you flew in today. Uh, imagine for a moment that I own that airplane, and I approach you and say, hey, uh, I would like to hire you for $500 to fly me from point A to point B, some destination. Um, is that something that you can accept and do, right? Can you accept money to fly somebody in their own airplane? Uh, the answer there is is yes. That's kind of a, a pilot contract, um, a pilot services deal, right? They're paying you for your piloting services. But if we change one little thing about that scenario and say, okay, now you own the airplane and you're the pilot and I approach you and ask to go to the same place, now can you do that? And the correct answer there is is probably not unless I hold a Part 135 certificate uh, and all the appropriate things that go along with that. Um, so if if you own if you own the airplane and you're flying the airplane, um, you cannot hold out or you can't advertise. Uh, you can't be willing to fly people from point A to point B on demand. That's something only an air carrier can do. And uh, just a random person who owns an airplane and happens to be a pilot, even if they're a commercial pilot, that doesn't make them an air carrier necessarily, right? They have to have that Part 135 uh, or Part 121 certificate. So we will have those discussions here. I'll, I'll ask a couple different scenarios on, you know, is it legal for you to do it in this scenario? And that just kind of covers the limitations um, that you have as a commercial pilot holder. Uh, I'll also ask, you know, what's your currency requirements? And that hasn't changed since private pilot. You still need your three takeoffs and landings within the previous 90 days in the category and class of aircraft being flown. Um, you will still need to have a, a current flight review done in the previous 24 calendar months. You, If uh, you're going to do any instrument stuff, you'll have to have your 66 hits. Um, so... We'll ask all of those questions. Those are kind of basic and really haven't changed since private pilot. But what has changed is your your limitations, uh, especially when it comes to 
flying for hire. Now, this is going to be one of the breakout episodes here in probably two or three weeks where I'll do a whole episode on illegal charter, and we'll really dive into this because I don't think there's good information out there. I mean, there is good information out there, but as far as a podcast or YouTube video format, um, somebody really explaining, here's all the ways that you can make money flying, and here's all the ways that uh, you really need to be cautious of that could get you into uh, quite a bit of trouble. Uh, some other resources that I'll that I'll reference here is uh, I've got a couple of websites and advisory circulars. So we have illegal charter, uh, avoid illegal charter dot com. We have uh, safe air charter operations, which is on the FAA website. We have advisory circular ninety one thirty seven B, which is truth in leasing. Advisory circular one twenty dash twelve A. Uh, which is private carriage versus common carriage of persons or property. And then advisory circular 61142, which is sharing aircraft operating expenses in accordance with uh, 61113C. So I will, uh, you know, I just referenced all those in the podcast. I'll put links to those in the podcast notes and on the YouTube um, comments or, or a description there. So that'll be something that you can pull up uh, at your convenience. But like I said, I'll be doing a longer podcast. That kind of deserves its own show, I think, uh, to really dive into. All right, next we're looking at task B, which is airworthiness requirements. Skill one, locate and describe airplane airworthiness and registration information. Skill two, determine the airplane is airworthy in a scenario given by the evaluator. Skill three, Apply appropriate procedures for operating with inoperative equipment in a scenario given by the evaluator. So those are our three skills that we're going to have to demonstrate in regards to airworthiness. Uh, now, airworthiness is a big item. I've done a couple shows, um, both on the private pilot episodes, uh, as well as with Max Trescott. You can find links to those shows on the website, uh, vsl.aero, and just navigate to the podcast section. You can find it there. Airworthiness, man, it's a really... It can be really complicated. Um, a lot of people will throw out the term tomato flames. I, I think a lot of pilots help you know learn required equipment based off of that. That's really not enough, right? Tomato flames, uh, the analogy I always use is, you know, imagine you're building a house. The first thing you build is the foundation. That is tomato flames. That's the foundation of a house. You can't live in a foundation, right? Uh, just as much as you can't fly an aircraft that just has tomato flames, right? If you imagine all the things in tomato flames, you gathered them all up and you put them in the hangar, you would have kind of a pile of parts. You wouldn't have an airplane. So obviously there's things that are required for you to fly that aren't listed in tomato flames. So you need to go out and look into other documents like uh, a minimum equipment list, a kinds of operation equipment list, a, a type certificate data sheet, uh, any supplemental type certificates, uh, any field approvals or that, that have been done on the aircraft. So there's several different things that can affect airworthiness other than tomato flames. Uh, of course, we need to understand uh, maintenance required inspections. Uh, we need to understand uh, airworthiness directives. And uh, some, some common things that I see applicants struggle with is knowing that uh, Airworthiness directives can be broken down into one-time uh, directives that are complied with and then aren't an issue anymore versus reoccurring airworthiness issues or airworthiness directives that maybe reoccur on an hourly or calendar basis. So this is an excellent example is the seat rails on a Cessna 172. They're due every 100 hours. So an airworthiness directive requires you to inspect those seat rails every 100 hours. So if you're flying a personally owned aircraft that doesn't have to go through a 100-hour inspection and you're flying it 300 hours a year, then, then three times during that year you need to be complying with that AD. And if you only do one annual, then there's a good chance you could fly it past that airworthiness directive timeline and, and have an unairworthy aircraft and not realize that. So that's one of the things that I see um, folks struggle with. The other thing is uh, giving kind of random... Uh, scenarios where, let's say, I, I love the Cessna 172, the stall warning horn. Let's say the stall warning horn is inoperative in a 172. Well, that stall warning horn isn't located in the acronym Tomato Flames, right? It's not in 91205, which is the FAR that that basically that 90, uh, that Tomato Flames stands for. Then, and by the way, in a check ride, if you say Tomato Flames, that's not I'm not going to fail you for that. But I would much rather hear you say Tomato Flames 
uh, is a reference to FAR 91205. That's good, right? Reference 91205, pull it open. Um, it's not anything you need to have memorized, right? Because it's not like a piece of, in, it's not as if the, you're going out to an airplane and if you don't have it memorized, you're not going to be able to reference 91205. It's not something you'll need to access during an emergency and have per perfect recall of, right? You have time to say, oh, this widget on the airplane's broken. Let me look in 91205 to see if that's a required item there. Uh, if it's not on there, let me look at the uh, the kinds of operation equipment list or the minimum equipment list for the airplane. Uh, and if it's not there, maybe the the type certificate data sheet. And, and anyway, if you're the PIC, right, so you can exercise PIC authority and say, well, even though that that widget is, is not required by anything and legally I could go fly with it in operative, I'm deciding I don't want to. And, and I'm, I'm going to you know, require that maintenance, uh, that that component be fixed before I go out and fly. That's completely fine. Um, so those are some of the things we'll, we'll talk about there. So being able to locate and describe airworthiness registration, well, that's in the plane. You should be able to tell me also of that needs to be visible to the passenger, right? So it can't be tucked away in a folder in the back pocket of the seat. It needs to be, usually it's in some sort of clear plastic holder that's visible to people that are in the airplane. Uh, determine the airplane is airworthy. Again, that that's going to be some sort of scenario that I give you where there's a piece of the plane that's that's inoperative, and I might give you a couple different iterations of that where there's a piece of equipment that's inoperative that's going to keep us grounded, and then there's a piece of equipment that's inoperative that we can actually go fly uh, while still being inoperative, and then the procedures that go along with that. So. I can't just go fly with inoperative equipment, even though it's not required, right? I have to do some things. I have to document that it's inoperative. I have to placard it, and I have to disable that component. And then I can't just fly with it inoperative indefinitely, right? I need to address that at the next inspection. And uh, there, there's some different options there. So we need to be able to talk through that. And then this is where I'm also going to have you pull out the um, the maintenance uh, records for the aircraft and prove to me on paper, hey, where's where's the annual, where's the 100-hour if required, uh, where are uh, the 91413, 91411 uh, checks as far as the pitot static and transponder system, the ELT, uh, all of those required inspections, you should be able to point, uh, confidently point to those in the aircraft records. So if you're going to a check ride and you've never seen the aircraft records that you're going to take the check ride in, that's a mistake. Make sure you sit down with your instructor and say, hey, before I go to my check ride, I want you to show me in here all the things the DPE could ask for. And so those most re recent inspections, compliance with airworthiness directives, those are all things that you need to be confidently uh, able to point to and reference during a check ride, especially as a commercial pilot, because it's important as a private pilot for sure, but as a commercial pilot, this is kind of the next level above a private pilot uh, you need to be confident in being able to determine the airworthiness of the airplane you're taking the check ride in, at least. All right, next we have weather. This is task C. So this is our third task so far in the oral. Uh, skill 1, use available aviation weather resources to obtain an adequate weather briefing. Skill 2, analyze the implications of at least three of the conditions listed in K3A through K3L above using actual weather or weather conditions in a scenario provided by the evaluator. Skill three, correlate weather information to make a com competent go-no-go -no -go decision. Uh, so this is uh, our first skill that we've seen that kind of has a circular reference in it, right? Instead of doing just one knowledge topic item, the skill is saying that we have to sample at least three conditions in the knowledge areas above. And the knowledge areas above, we have a, a kind of a whole host of weather um topics that we can talk about. We need to talk about at least three of those uh, and then cover at least one risk management item. So use available aviation resources to obtain an adequate weather briefing. Um, that includes ForeFlight, right? There's a new advisory circular that I talk about uh, using uh, ForeFlight for your instrument check ride. You can look that up on the podcast feed or in um, on the YouTube page. But I, I referenced an advisory circular that recently came out on how to conduct a pilot self-briefing. And there is no, like, official weather source the FAA wants you to use. You can use pretty much anything. There's some good resources out there that help you um, find the right, you know, basically have a checklist format. 
I'm a big proponent of Four Flight. If you watched any of my stuff, you know that. Uh, I love Four Flight. I think it's a game changer, and it has a great briefing function that fulfills basically everything that that re advisory circular requires. It covers weather notams, adverse conditions, all of that stuff. So if you f show up and you're confident by using the Four Flight briefing function, that's completely fine with me. If all your weather is coming from Four Flight, that's fine. Um, there's three different ways in ForeFlight you can generate a weather briefing. You can generate it uh, on a text basis, a PDF form, or an HTML form. That's another thing that I that I cover in uh, my web series, so you can go back and look at that. But either either of those ways, you show up and you're confident on how to use that. That fulfills this task here. Um, so don't show up just expecting ForeFlight to be easy and never have used it before. You know, watch some of my videos. Watch some, you know, other people have videos on this. ForeFlight has great tutorials as well. Be confident on using the, that briefing function. If you're using something other than ForeFlight, that's fine too. I don't care if you show up and you've got everything printed out in a three-ring binder uh, or you show up with a desktop computer and that'd be a little weird. But, you know, if you show up with a desktop computer and, and put it down and say, hey, here's all the websites that I have bookmarked and I'm going to go to all these, hey, that's fine too. Uh, I don't care if you've uh, used calligraphy and you've transcribed it on a scroll and you pull out the scroll out of your your trench coat and you say, here's my weather briefing and you read it to me in old English. I don't really care as long as you've covered uh, the weather briefing, uh, the adverse conditions, you know, the weather forecast for our departure, arrival, and entry places, and, and you can describe the conditions that are listed here. Um, so there, there's a lot of different ways you can skin this cat. All right, skill two, uh, being able to do the three conditions. We already kind of talked about that. And then skill three, correlate information to make a competent go-no-go -go decision. So I've talked about this before on kind of the knowledge pyramid, but you know if you imagine uh, a knowledge pyramid with with data uh, first, that's kind of the foundation, and then you've got information is the next tier, and then you have knowledge, and then the the top of the pyramid is wisdom. So, um, you know, a weather forecast is full of data, uh, usually operations like four flight or the national weather service turn that data into information so they give us instead of just numbers we know that that's a wind speed right so now we have information and now we take that wind speed and we correlate it to um the direction that the wind's going and, and where that wind's located now that's knowledge right we know the wind uh in relation or you know our crosswind and tailwind or headwind component at our, our local airport we want to turn all that into wisdom so the wisdom part of that is taking the knowledge of the weather and being able to wisely um, to predict how's that how's that going to impact our ability to fly safely. So that's what we're going to talk about here: is correlate that weather information into a go no go decision. So is it safe for me to go? If it's not, is there a way forward? Right? Could I change a parameter about my uh, flight, either the runway that I'm using or the time of day that I'm going, or maybe the aircraft that I'm using, or possibly bringing an instructor along. But we're going to try to find a way to go. Now, some days using the actual weather, it'll just be, a, yeah, there's a line of thunderstorms that's 600 miles long and goes up to 50,000 feet. We're just, there's, we're not going today. There's no way around that. Um, so, the correct answer, or the correct answer there would be, well, we're going to cancel today, and we're going to reschedule for three days from now because I look at the prog chart and I can see that this high pressure system is going to push this through, and in three days, it'll be clear as a bell, and we can do the the flight safely. So that just that discussion right there covers all of the items and all the skills listed in this section of the ACS. All right, now we're over to our cross country flight planning. This is task D. Uh, skill one of task D, prepare, present, and explain a cross-country flight plan assigned by the evaluator, including a risk analysis based on real-time weather, to the first fuel stop. Skill two, apply pertinent information from the appropriate and current aeronautical charts, chart supplements, notams, relative to your airport, runway, and taxiway closures, and other flight publications. Skill three, create a navigation plan and simulate filing a VFR flight plan. Skill four, recalculate fuel reserves based on a scenario provided by the evaluator. So four skills, they're all pretty clear. Uh, the first one, you know, literally just present me your cross-country scenario. Uh, I have a lot of my applicants plan to go down to Destin, Florida from Russellville. 
Destin has some interesting airspace to deal with. We'll talk about here in just a second. That, that kind of helps me check that box. Uh, the other thing is, is it's a realistic destination to want to go to because that's a popular vacation spot for folks around here. Uh, and a lot of people actually do fly down to Destin. That's a, that's a very popular place. So talk to me about that flight. Um, what are some of the, the challenges you see with that in, in your particular aircraft? Um, and then on as far as skill two is concerned, it kind of ties back into the four flight briefing. If you use four flight, it already looked up those adverse conditions to include runway closures and taxiway closures. Uh, it has your chart supplement and stuff in there. Uh, and, and runway lengths and all of that information. So that's part of that uh, standardized four-flight briefing, which is really nice. So we're, we can talk about that in Skill 2. Skill 3, create a navigation plan, simulate filing a VFR flight plan. That's interesting because even though you're instrument rated, nine times out of ten, 99% of the applicants that take their commercial are also instrument rated. So even though you're instrument rated, you may say, well, I always fly instrument. Well, the ACS is telling you to file a VFR flight plan. So we need to be able to simulate doing that. Uh, so there's a way in four flight where I can actually generate uh, an FAA VFR flight plan or a international flight plan form. I can I can generate both of those in that in that application. So we need to be able to simulate that. Uh, and then recalculate fuel reserves based on a scenario. So I'm going to give you some sort of scenario that may cause you to divert from point A to point B uh, or, or something like that. So you, you're going to have to change on the fly your plan from point A to point B to now you're going to have to figure in this diversion. That's going to change your fuel uh, and your time. And you're going to need to show me that you can successfully do that. So those are, um, those are the skills that we're going to have to do there. Uh, let's see. Let me look at the knowledge items here. The um, I think all of those are pretty straightforward. Uh, having the risk management, as it kind of spells out the PAVE acronym there, um, but but having the ability to to analyze, hey, all of these elements that could impact my cross country flight planning. Um, how am I going to account for those? And I may build that in the scenario. I may say, well, you're you actually. At the last minute, you had a passenger get added that this is her first time in an airplane. Um, how could that affect your cross-country flight plan, right? Maybe we need to plan another fuel stop because they don't really know how to uh, tactically dehydrate yourself a little bit for a, a GA flight. And maybe they just drank a lot of coffee, ate a big meal, and they're going to need a bathroom stop a lot earlier than what you're planning on doing that. So that might be a, a realistic scenario that we could add in there. Next one is uh, task E, or National Airspace System. Uh, it has three skills. Skill one, identify and comply with uh, requirements of, for basic VFR weather minimums and flying in particular classes of airspace. Correctly identify airspace that operate in accordance with associated communication and equipment requirements. Identify the requirements for operating in SUA or within a TFR. Identify and comply with SATR and SAFRA operations if applicable. All right, so this is where my cross-country uh, to Destin comes into play because it is a uh, special air traffic rule area uh, or more commonly or I guess broadly uh, Part 93 airspace. So that's going to be something that's different about Destin, especially if you're going down there VFR. Um I will ask you how to find uh, how to find and alert yourself to temporary flight restrictions. Uh, where are you going to check that? Again, Four Flight has that ability. There's also a website that you can check along with your notams to alert you of any TFRs. Uh, being able to identify and comply with airspace requirements. That's a pretty straightforward scenario. What I'm going to do is look at your flight plan, and I'm going to point to different things on that flight plan. Maybe MOAs, maybe Class Delta or Charlie or Bravo. And I'll just ask, hey, if we were wanting to divert into this air, airport here, uh, what kind of equipment would we need on our aircraft? What kind of communication requirements would be required of us to enter that airspace? Uh, we'll probably talk about MOAs. Um, do you have to avoid them? Um, if you don't have to avoid, avoid them, uh, why wouldn't you? And how can you find out more about NOTAMs as far as if they're active or not active? Uh, hint. You know, having flight following and checking your NOTAMs beforehand, that's the best way to avoid NOTAMs there, or MOAs. Um, so that's a pretty straightforward um, 
task right here is just knowing the national airspace system. I think uh, I, I don't have many people struggle with this. This is usually one that, that people are prepared for. But just be prepared to be able to look at a sectional and describe to me everything on that sectional. If you can do that, then you'll pass this with flying colors, right? If you struggle knowing the difference between class Delta and Bravo, then we're going to have an issue there. Um, so definitely know the equipment requirements. That's another thing that trips some people up is, you know, where do I need ADSB and where do I not need ADSB? That's a question that I'll definitely ask, and a lot of DPs, I'm sure, will ask that. Uh, so transponder requirements, radio requirements, ADSB, those are all things that are going to come up here. F, uh, performance and limitations. Two skills, compute weight and balance, correct out of center of gravity loading errors, and determine if weight and balance remains within limits during all phases of flight. Skill two, utilize the appropriate airplane manufacturer's approved performance charts, tables, and data. So two skills here, being able to um, correct an out of balance situation in the plane. Um, so I'm, I'm going to have you use your knowledge of weight and balance to give you some sort of problem of, hey, there's some extra equipment I'll need to bring or a couple extra people, or I want to increase the distance, which is going to increase the required fuel. So I will give you some sort of problem there that you're going to have to deal with on a weight and balance form. So if you have some sort of digital way to calculate weight and balance, that'll save you a lot of time, and that's completely fine with me. So there's you know, the electronic E6B, there's uh, there's phone apps for this. And, of course, ForeFlight has a weight and balance function that works really good. So uh, being confident and knowing how to use that, I think, is really, uh, it'll really help you be successful in this section, especially if you're very comfortable with ForeFlight and you can show me, hey, I've built this aircraft profile. Here's the arms. Here's the basic setup. Here's the picture of the envelope. And here's how I can change loading criteria for the different um, stations and uh, pilot seats and baggage compartments. So that would be really useful to know how to use the four flight weight and balance function. And then utilize airplane manufacturers approved performance charts, tables, and data. Uh, so be comfortable with the takeoff and landing charts and cruise charts. Uh, if you're going to use four flight performance data, that's a question that will come up as well, right? If you tell me, well, I'm just going to use four flight, well, you could have put in the wrong information into four flight, and it will give you the perfectly wrong information in return. So kind of the crap in, crap out uh, theory of operation there. So you need to be comfortable and confident in showing me that, hey, this is my calculated takeoff distance according to the manufacturer's charts, and it would be great as far as a – risk management item to say, uh, well, this is my calculated performance, but I'm actually going to put in a safety factor and increase my, uh, and what I mean by that is, let's say you, you, you need 500 feet, uh, or you need 1,000 feet to take off within 172 or your traveler or whatever. Uh, I might multiply that by 1.5, right? That's going to add 50% to that. So now I need 1,500 feet, and I'm adding that 1.5 safety factor to account for age of the aircraft and, and my ability, essentially, uh, because those charts were written for a perfect airplane on a perfect day with a test pilot. So adding in some, we'll call it slop, so adding in some slop to those charts and being conservative. So instead of saying, well, it's going to take me exactly 9 986 feet to take off, you're going to say, well, I'm going to round up to 1,000 and then add 50% to that, so it's going to take me 1,500 feet to take off today. Well, I'll buy that, right? That's good risk management. Same thing on your landing distance. If your landing distance is exactly 500 feet, I might say, well, um, 500 feet, again, perfect day, test pilot, perfect airplane, uh, good braking conditions and all that. I'm going to go ahead and just round it up to the nearest 1,000 and say, yeah, it's going to be 1,000 feet to me. Uh, for me today, or I could use the 1.5 or 2.0. Kind of what I do is I add 1.5 to all of my numbers in the day when it's dry, and if it's wet or at night, I add 2.0. So I double the length that I require for night operations or if it's wet. And that's just me. Um, but I, I think that's reasonable, especially these smaller airplanes. You're really not limiting yourself too much. Um, it's rare to see a general aviation plane that requires a landing or takeoff distance of over 4,000 feet. So, yeah, doubling that, there's not as many 8,000-foot runways, uh, but that might make you think twice of if I'm doing a night cross-country, instead of landing somewhere with a very small runway, I'm going to land to that Class Charlie, pay a little bit extra for fuel, but I got a longer runway, I got more services, and there's a lot more, more margin for error uh, at night when we tend to have more errors. 
So that's just some uh, some discussion on that as far as risk management goes. All right, area of operation G, uh, operations of systems. We have two skills here. Operate at least three of the systems listed in K1A through K1L above appropriately. And then skill two is use appropriate checklists properly. So here's our, our second kind of circular reference. It's saying, hey, go back to the knowledge area, pick three of those systems, and ask uh, questions about those. So there, that's kind of the menu of items that I could ask as a DPE. Um, and I'm not really res strictly, well, I'm restricted to those items to ask you questions about, but those items are very broad. So, um, you know, power plant and propeller. I can kind of ask anything about a power plant and propeller. So we can get down to the nitty gritty and start talking about uh, cams and shafts and and magnetos and accessory gear cases and you know I, I could get down to that granular level level I might just ask uh, well, what kind of engine do you have in your airplane um, so we're gonna ask about three of those systems so you really need to sit down with your instructor and make sure you can really talk through each one of those systems listed there it's a very easy study item right you can sit down and go through uh, we've got uh, three, six, nine, twelve, uh, twelve 6, 9, 12, 12 or 13 systems there and then indications of uh, procedures for man managing systems, abnormalities, or failures. So if I ask about a system, I'm probably going to ask, well, what, what are some ways that system can fail? And if that system failed, what implications is that going to have on your flight? So your electrical system, I might ask you to describe it. And then I might ask you also to explain to me how you would handle an electrical failure on your flight. Uh, and that would drive us to that second skill of using the appropriate checklist, because part of that action of an electrical failure uh, would be, well, I'm going to get my checklist out and I'm going to use my electrical failure checklist to handle this uh, emergency procedure. H, human factors, task H. Uh, it has two skills. Associate the symptoms and effects for at least three of the conditions in K1A through uh, a through K1L above uh, with the cause and corrective action. And skill two, perform self-assessment, including fitness for flight, and personal minimums for actual flight or a scenario given by the evaluator. So we have another reference here where now I've got a menu of items that I can ask from. So another easy, easy study uh, thing is to go through each of those symptoms with your instructor. Make sure you're confident in explaining all of those. Uh, I'll probably ask about alcohol and drug use, uh, not illicit drugs necessarily, but uh, also over-the-counter drugs or uh, prescribed drugs, because that's something that a lot of pilots may not understand is they go to their uh, primary care physician, they get on a new prescription, and they don't check back with their other physician, which is their uh, their AME, and, and that medication that you just got on, that might have implications on your, on your medical. So uh, we need to be able to correlate those two, and there's some resources out there like AOPA, uh, that's really good, but but really, you know, you need to involve your medical, your aeronautical medical examiner in your personal health uh, when you have major changes like that, like you get on a new medication or you have a surgery or you're hospitalized for something. Uh, so that's a question that I'll ask there. And then knowing um, kind of the rules around alcohol, you know, if you choose to go out there and have something to drink, how does that affect your ability to fly the airplane? Uh, and then legally, how long do you need to wait before you get in the airplane? Uh, that kind of ties in directly with aeronautical decision making, and I'll probably ask you some sort of scenario that that maybe explains how you've you know maybe gotten out of a, a really long uh, work day after a long week, and you're going to go on vacation, and this is an expensive vacation. Um, so kind of explain uh, we've got all these reasonable um, external pressures pressuring you to fly, plus a little bit of fatigue. Uh, you know how are you going to determine if you're fit to fly at that point. Um, so that's that's kind of the discussion that we'll have around the commercial uh, human factor piece. And then the, we're at our last one. This is our water and seaplane characteristics. So we're not going to go into that because we're sticking to single engine land. Um, that ends our area of operation one. So that is pretty much our oral. Um, our oral will obviously it'll last a little bit longer than this, I think. Uh, we've been going for about 40 minutes, um, maybe a little bit less. So, and that's pretty typical for a check ride. The oral for the commercial is going to last around from an hour to an hour point five after we've done the admin stuff. It may feel a little bit longer than that. 
Um, if you're prompt at answering these questions and you're not having to look them up and you're and you're not you know just rattling off guesses and having to second guess yourself, it'll go a lot quicker, right? Um, if you're not confident in the ACS or what questions are going to be asked, um, it can take a lot longer than an hour. It, it might take three hours to get all the information out there. So the better prepared you are, the shorter the oral is going to be and the quicker that we're going to get out to and start the pre-flight and the flying. So uh, tune in next time. We're going to start an area of operation two for pre-flight procedures, and we'll probably go through uh, the whole pre-flight uh, I'll talk about some airworthiness items again that I like to ask on the pre-flight, and then we might get into the first couple of uh, maybe takeoff or taxi maneuvers. We'll see how that goes. But uh, thank you again for listening and watching. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Tell your friends about it. Um, bring us up, and I, lo I love it when people bring up the podcast in Facebook groups to help people study for their check rides. I think they are honestly a good way to help you prepare. I love podcasts because you can just throw an earbud in and listen while you're doing chores. And I think this is a good thing that you can listen to if you're looking to prepare for your commercial check ride. So thanks again for watching and listening, and I'll see you next time. See you.